joined now by someone who started out as a supporting artist and worked on four Doctor Whos with Peter Davison. But that was only the beginning of a long television career that would eventually lead him behind the camera. So I'd like to introduce supporting artist Miles Ross. How are you? I'm very good, thank you, Alex. Very good. As I, said, I wanted to take you back to the early 80s when you were busy as a sporting artist, but you first came in contact with Doctor Who. Was it a show that you had a great awareness of beforehand? Oh, yes, I was a big fan of Doctor Who. Um, as a child, obviously, Cybermen, and we'd watched all of the Doctors. And, uh, you know, and it was always a, a must see in our house. So, yeah, it was good fun. It was exciting actually going in and seeing the TARDIS and being part of Doctor Who um, because as a childhood fan. And your first story was Earthshock in which you played a trooper. Was it nice to be working alongside the Cybermen? Yeah, it was. I mean, sometimes when you meet your heroes, it, uh, it's not the best thing to do, but it was, it was great. You know, they looked, um, they looked good. What really impressed me was the amount of work that went into having uh, black and decker drills underneath things to make the TARDIS work and to move stuff around and and just how inventive they all were, all the props guys and and, and how the attention to detail was really good. Uh, there was there was one scene in particular when uh, the doors had to open and you'd think that they would just have two guys operating them but they were actually mechanical, they actually had made mechanical doors um so yeah it was uh and all that side of it i enjoyed all that i enjoyed the backstage side of it probably more than being in front of the camera to be honest i enjoyed the cameras and, and the rest of it and how it all worked more than some people obviously like being in front of the camera and acting but i actually enjoyed behind the scenes so you made the most of not just doctor but all of your sort of television supporting artists work then yeah, absolutely. Um, it was a great grounding for me. I eventually went on to work in TV, producing and directing shows and worked with um, Lee Evans and Rob Brydon and Peter Cook and Harry Enfield and all sorts of amazing people um, in the comedy world. And, and I really think that the extra work was a great way of, without any pressure, being involved in, and seeing how people react and seeing uh, how things are done. It was a, a really good grounding and looking at techniques and looking at how different people work. You know, I got to work with some great, great directors, you know, that, that were really impressive. And, and, you, and it's just, it was just good to, to be able to absorb that without having to make any of the decisions or worry about any of it, which obviously came later. And would you have had a great deal of involvement with the directors or was it just sort of a watch and observe more than anything? No, occasionally with some of the stuff that I did, they would, um, we would do a bit of training. Sometimes we had rehearsals where we would train how to drill like soldiers and to work things. I did the Spanish Civil War um, uh, series on the BBC and I've did a few Nazi Mitford with, at the BBC, a few Nazi things. And they, they, they trained us, you know, they had, they had military guys in and taught us how to shoulder arms and, 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 once you could do that kind of stuff, they'd ask you, the directors would, would talk to you and, and ask you to do stuff, you know. I mean, usually it pretty much boiled down to quicker, slower. But then I found out when I started directing, that's pretty much what you tell the main actors as well. You know, when you're directing, you want it at a certain speed. So at the time, I thought it was just us, but no. But it was just good to watch them working with the actors and working with the setups and, and how they would do, you know, a wide establishing shot and do, all, and do all the locations first so that they could recreate the light when they brought it inside. And so when we did Doctor Who, we, we spent some time in, a, in an old quarry first for the first few days. And then we moved into the studio and, and did all the interiors so they could obviously, if it had been raining like it usually was, they could match the outside light and... And one particularly striking studio set would have been in Frontiers, which was the story with the Tractators. Was that quite as impressive as it looks on screen? Yeah, it was. It really was. I think it was in the big old Studio 8 at White City, which was one of the biggest studios. And um, 
I particularly remember it because during lunch, one of the obscenely big lights had fallen from the, from the, from the sky, from the, the light rig, and had smashed onto the floor. And it would have killed a couple of people had it not been remarkably during lunch. So that's, yeah, it, but it was very impressive that, um, that set. You know, as I said before, they did do a lot of really good work. Obviously, the budgets were far superior because of the economy of TV and the way it all worked then. So they were able to, but they did, um, they, 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 all the BBC guys, obviously, are always very good, you know, the in-house guys, before they started getting rid of people, that was. So, and in that story, you, you, one of your scenes was attacking one of the tractators, which I believe the, the actors inside weren't too uh, pleased with that. No, um, the only people who could actually get into the tractator's costumes and move for, any, for more than like three or four minutes physically were the Royal Ballet. So they brought a lot of the Royal Ballet guys in and a couple of them were quite, um, they weren't very tough, shall we say. Um, and obviously we have to set about them with, with pipes in, in the, you know, to try and bring them down. And there was a lot of complaining about, oh, you're hitting too hard. So it was um, a few takes more than it should have been doing, doing that. But obviously we were, we always wanted, but the younger extras wanted to please. They were much, you'd think it'd be the other way around. You'd think they'd be a bit too cool for school and a bit, a bit bullshit, but we always wanted to please. If the director said, do this, we would do it with vigor and gusto. And, and this was one of those reasons, you know, this is why we wanted to make things, because obviously a lot of the times when you had whips, they were foam. When you had pipes, lead pipes, they were foam. So you would put a bit more in to make it look like it had a bit of weight in it. But um, on this occasion, we all got a bit carried away. It was the, it was the first take in particular, I now recall, that we uh, set about them. And the part that was perhaps a little bit more straightforward was uh, running around for Mordred Undead as a schoolboy. That must have been nice to be on location for a change. Yeah, it was a lovely, as I remember it, I actually took a lot of photographs, but we never took photographs legally, which we did occasionally of sets and things. Um, but I remember taking a lot of photographs of the grounds, which were particularly nice. It was a beautiful place. I, I can't remember where it was, but it was a beautiful place. And, and, and yeah, and obviously I was about 20 years old then, 20, yeah, probably 20, 21. So running around wasn't such a problem. And uh, and it was it was a nice day as well, which was which was a bonus. So yeah, it was good. It was, and, and that would have been a particularly busy time at the BBC. I imagine you'd have done odd days here and there on on various programmes. You would never on it for a, a whole week or anything. Oh no, we did weeks. Yeah, we did. We would do a week sometimes, because as I say, if you were part of a squad or if you were in an army or. You know, they would use the same guys. Um, I mean, and and I, I often did, a, you know, I often got a week's work on things. Not not much more than a week, but often often a week. But the, but in those days, there was. It's not like it is now. In those days, I was I was regularly working five days a week, often weekends. You know, there was uh, there was a lot more work, a lot more productions, in, in that sense you know, than there is now. And how would you have found the, the regular TARDIS team? You know, Peter Davison, Janet Fielding, Mark Strix, and do, would you have had much to do with them? Not much. They were very nice, though. I remember them all being very nice. And they would often chat to you just out of a courtesy thing. And I think it was because we were young. Um, that they, on various different shows, I remember people starting with, this is good fun, isn't it? And this must be good for you because you're young and this is, and we would all say, yeah, it's great, you know? So there was a lot of times when those kind of conversations went on with the leading uh, leading characters and the, and the proper actors because um, I think that they just felt it, it, it was a good thing to to break the ice and just, and, and it was, a, and it was, as I say, I noticed a reoccurring theme in about our age and, you know, this is great lark, isn't it? The singer dressing up in outfits and running around and chasing 
running away from Cybermen and Daleks and which it was, you know. So yeah, they did talk to us quite a lot, you know, and they did um sometimes they would ask if we did a lot of work, you know, I remember quite a few times saying, you know, and and, and often ask if if about acting and stuff. Which for some reason I would seem to say, no, I don't really want to be an actor. This is just a, a good good living. But I don't recall them talking to the older guys much because they always tend to be, as I say, a bit more doer and a bit more, you know, they were, they were, they were, they liked a bit of a moan. So. And also at the BBC, you were in the last episode of Ain't Half Hot Mum. What was the atmosphere like at the time? Was it quite sad that this was the end of the series? Well, it was and it wasn't because it was live. They filmed it in front of a live studio audience. So you would rehearse during the day and the scenes that, that I was in were demob. So we're all leaving the army. Um, but they were good gigs to get because obviously you got there about eight o'clock and, and you wouldn't finish until 10 at night. So there was, there was good overtime. But there, was a, there were genuinely, um, I, I can't really remember exactly, but I tended to think that a lot of them felt that enough was enough that they were quite tired of it you know especially those that had that could go on and do career that had other things going on and I mean it was always when it when anything ends it's not not a great feeling but I don't remember it being particularly uh sad for, for the cast and crew I don't I don't think it was uh it wasn't as as sad as as, as all that but they were a particularly nice bunch, I think, because they'd been working together for so long and it had been such a successful show. They, um, they uh, were definitely um, very friendly. And I remember I was at the Comedy Awards many, many years later and one of the writers was receiving, I think there was a pair of them who wrote it. Was it David Croft? And I can't remember the other guy's name. And just by chance, I was on the table with him. And we had a great chat because I said, oh, you know, I was an extra in the, in the last, before I did comedy for a living, I was an extra in the last episode. And, and although he was very old, it was, an, it was a nice way to break the ice, reminiscent to when they would talk to me as a youngster and say, oh, what, you know. But yeah, he was getting a Lifetime Achievement Award and I happened to be on a table with him. So... Yeah, they were they were very nice people. I must admit, but not everyone was very nice. Um, Trevor Eve was particularly awkward. Who did shoestring? I'm sure that I mean I've I've I know him a little bit now because I worked at Talkback Thames for quite a while, and he his company was housed there, and and I mentioned to him that I'd done some extra work on shoestring, and he went, "Oh God, you're probably going to tell me how dreadful I was." That's when I was drinking that, and I said, "Well." You weren't that dreadful, but you weren't very, he wasn't very professional. He would take the clothes home and, and turn up late and then he would have the wrong things and, but he was very good in it. So I suppose they can often get away with it when they're very good in it. But yeah, they weren't all nice. So what programs particularly stood out for you then, which are, are particularly happy memories? Um, I suppose the, the ones where I got to do things like, play in the 66 World Cup final reactment with David Jason in a sharp intake of breath, which was, you know, as a, as a, as a youngster who played football all the time, although I was, a, I was the German captain, Franz Beckenbauer, um, it was a great thing to walk out. And when we walked out on the pitch for the show, they played the recording of the 66 crowd and it was quite incredible. And it also shocked me the size of the pitch was huge absolutely enormous and it was just a completely joyous day you know because obviously where you're going to change in the dressing room so we were in their dressing rooms that Bobby Moore sat in and and the Charltons and Cohen and all of them you know and uh, and then they took us at lunchtime they said if you want to you can join the tour and we joined one of the official tours and went round and it was just great you know uh, and often you got to go to amazing places and, and do some interesting things, you know. So it was, uh, but that's a particularly, for me, that's probably the number one memory of, uh, 
of, of great times. And something like that, are you just told to turn up at this day in this place, or are you given much forewarning of what you'll be doing? No, we were picked because we were a football team. We were all down. Lots of times you t- people say, can you horse ride? And people go, yeah, and then they put them on a horse and it, it was a disaster. And, and lots of times they would say, can you play bowls? And they couldn't, they didn't a clue, but they would just say yes to get the work. Um, but I figured out quite early that wasn't always the best way to go just to avoid awkward situations. And we were, we, we were all good footballers. We all played to a good level. Um, there weren't really that many guys who, who, couldn't, who weren't footballers, who couldn't play. Because we were... I did three or four things as a footballer. I did Who Dares Wins, which is quite an experience because um, it was during the half-time in one of the Wimbledon games, and Wimbledon were a very big team. And we all ran out of the pitch half time, and the abuse we got from the crowd was a bit shocking. The, the level and the and the language, and uh, yeah, so that was a, that was interesting. The it was quite a hostile atmosphere, um, to say the least. But yeah, we I did quite a few football jobs and running jobs. I did two or three jobs running, and I remember, I think there was an Anthony Hopkins thing which was he directed, called, I think it was called um, Autumn or something like that. And uh, we, we were runners in that. And another BBC thing that I've forgotten the name of it now, that, that we were runners. And also I did quite a lot of military things. I did a thing, Aerodrome, a series called Aerodrome with Colin Firth, which wasn't my favourite thing because they cut my hair the height of my eyebrows all the way around, which was a bit severe. But that was a good week's work down at the, um, at the, uh, the Biggin Hill Aerodrome. And they had, they had, um, we were all in futuristic, we were all futuristic pilots. And they had um, made regular planes up to look like planes of the future, which was quite cool. So how did that move to directing and later producing come about? Well, I, I stopped, I stopped once after I'd stopped doing the extra work and did a few, few other odd jobs. I, um, I got a job working on a BBC quiz show called going for gold as a question writer. A friend of mine was there. She was a secretary there and she got me in. And from from going from gold, I then moved over to a youth programme called Network 7, which was super hip, live 12 till 2 or 12 till 1 Sundays. And quite rapidly, fortunately, I worked my way up there very quickly. So I went from being a sort of researcher to an associate producer. And then that team moved on and made another arts music show called Club X. And I was one of the producers on that. So it was quite a meteoric rise for me, which was great. And then after Club X, which had been a bit of a difficult show and a disaster because it moved around each week, a different venue, which was in a different place, which was a logistic nightmare, which I was partly involved with being responsible for. So that was difficult. After that, that's when I first got into comedy. When BSB first started, before it merged with Sky, they were looking for lots of producers, and um, and that's where I really started doing the comedy stuff. So was that a deliberate move to go towards comedy in terms of producing, or was it just? How yeah, it was. Yeah, one of the guys I'd been working with said to me, "Look, you you you're very funny, and you you you've got a good comedy eye. You should get into comedy." I think he just didn't want to give me a, a third job in a row on his next show, The Word. He went on to do The Word. So I think there was definitely some of that. Because by then, obviously, you work with people for three or four years. And especially in, in the media, you run out of stories to tell each other and you kind of get a bit bored with the same faces, which I later found. So, yeah, it definitely was a, a, a conscious effort. I went back and did something else, a th- series with Stephen Burke of called True or False, which was the thing I'd written on Network 7. It was a little sort of six-minute strand, and they turned it into a programme, 
that was a bit of a mistake because I didn't produce it and I shouldn't have gone back and done it, but I did anyway because I didn't really want to let it go. But I wasn't in control of it and I didn't like the way it turned out. So, But after that, I then went and joined a TV company called Noel Gay and they made seven, eight hours a week of comedy for BSB before it was, when it was the Square Reel. And that was just fantastic. You know, I got to work with young writer Armando Iannucci and Bedil and Newman were young writers on it and lots of people that Chris Morris's first ever, I worked with Chris Morris on his first ever TV venture, produced and directed his strands for, for BSB. And so it was a really good, really good place to be. And the guy that ran it all was the legendary Young Ones producer, Paul Jackson. And he kind of took a bit of a shine to me, which was great, and took me under his wing a bit, and we got on very, very well. And they moved me around different shows, and probably wasn't the best thing to have done to have left there, but I got tempted away by the Viz guys to go and produce the Viz animation series with Peter Cook and Harry Enfield and Kathy Burke and... Carolina Hearn and John Thompson and Simon Day. So it was like, okay, that's pretty good. That's pretty exciting. So yeah, and then from, from there I went and worked, uh, I'd done a couple of, I directed a couple of pilots in Granada. I went and worked for Granada where I met Lee Evans and then set a company up with Lee Evans and went off to America and made a couple of movies and then came back with Lee Evans. And then that ended and I joined, worked up with Rob Brydon. He had just done Marion and Jeff, and we had a company for about ten years, and that was pretty much it. Well, on the note of those incredible comedy greats, I just love to point to say thank you very much for your time, Miles. You're welcome. Thank you, Alex.